Have you ever heard of Candyman? And if you look in the mirror, you say his name five times. In cities everywhere. Candyman? They whisper his name. Right. Candyman. It's just a story. Candyman. Candyman. Just a ghost story. Candyman. <laughs> An entire community starts attributing the daily horrors of their lives to a mythical figure. The legend first appeared in 1890. He was attacked, mutilated, and burned to death. Poor Candyman. <laughs> Helen, a woman died in there. Leave it. Everyone knows he isn't real. That's modern oral folklore. Everyone. Except Helen Lyle. Bring it up. It ain't safe around here. I don't scare it too easy. Wanna know about Ruthie Jean? They ain't never gonna catch him. Who? Candyman. Helen. Who is that? Helen, I came for you. Do I know you? Now, she is about to discover. Helen? What's behind the mystery? I'm sick. What's behind the legend? Listen, he's under the bed! And most terrifying of all... Come with me. What's behind the mirror? He's here. Candyman, you don't have to believe. Just beware. All right. Hey, we're back with another edition of 90s Night. Um, hey, I'm your host, Benner, from Black Fawn Distro. I'm, of course, joined by the uh, incomparable Kells McNells. <laughs> um, Kells, how you doing? Who are you tonight? And uh, let's talk about what we're reviewing. Yes, tonight I am doing well. And tonight I am Helen, um, naturally. Uh, and... <laughs> <laughs> I see you have a sweet yeah, tooth course, tonight. Of course. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was, I, I picked sweet tooth, a little bit of a video game tie in, I guess there uh, to uh, twisted metal, but I fi I figured it was probably pretty fitting. And yes, that's right. We're reviewing Candyman, and uh, from 1992, um, of course we've been away for a few weeks, but uh, we're really pleased to be back and we are honored to be part of the um, Halloween in May programming uh which is being put on by the casey ferguson show i'm uh, really stoked to be part of that and uh i'm wearing of course um you know listen my my you know face a face made for radio of course right <laughs> but uh for those of you i know you can't see me but i am wearing a orange plaid shirt and a black hat so hey just jumping into the halloween spirit six months before i actually need to so uh really really pumped to be a be a part of this uh what about yourself kels uh you loving the halloween in may or what yeah, I'm I'm I mean, I'm living Halloween all year round, but I am particularly enthused about Halloween in May because it is immediate and that I'm always for. So I, I love any time that we can kind of celebrate like a halfway to any holiday, just you know, for, for giggles. Breaks up, uh, breaks up the year a bit, right? Breaks, breaks up the year. Bit. Why yeah. why not, right? So I'm a I'm always for a Halloween in May. And I, this is my first hearing of it, but I feel like I shall continue to do it from now on. Yeah, and, and for for the record, you 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 heard about it before we did the show. Yes. Right. No. Right. You're, you're not saying this that you is... just heard about it live on air. Yeah. yeah this exactly. is the first I'm hearing of this. No, no. This was something <laughs> I knew about. However, the celebration of Halloween in May is, is new to me. And I, I definitely want to continue doing that because why the heck not, right? Okay. Well, let's uh, let, let's jump in. Let's not keep the listeners, uh, listeners waiting. They're here for some horror. And we want to talk yes. about this movie because it's one of our favorites from the 1990s. And I think it's pretty underrated. And um, Or maybe not. Maybe underrated is the, the wrong word. I know we got it in the ticker at the, on the bottom of the screen there. But maybe underappreciated. I just think this movie is way better than it gets credit for sometimes. And uh, But we're going to dive into it for sure. Now, before we do, just a spoiler warning. If you haven't seen the film and really would like to see the, the original Candyman and you haven't mm -hmm. seen it over the last... 30 years this is maybe your warning and your your time to duck out uh stop watching the program stop listening to the program but we you know we're just assuming that you have seen the film or want to hear us ramble on and talk about it so yeah. um but that's stop your and drop and watch if you need to that's right that's right now yeah. kels uh you always have a drink to go along with every movie I that do. we do on 90s night and uh, of Ooh. course uh, we are um we're on 
uh, uh, we will broadcast this program on YouTube as well, eventually for our regular, uh, um, our regular audience. And of course, mm -hmm. if you are watching this on YouTube, please uh, give us a subscribe and uh, give us a follow. Find us on social media at Black Fawn Distro. Uh, yes, thanks. And Kels has got the thumbs up with the fireworks in the background. Awesome sauce. And uh, of course, yeah, follow us on Instagram or Twitter or formerly X or whatever it's called now. I don't know. Um, but I know I have that backwards, but who cares? No one's on that platform anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, follow us on Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff. So anyway, stuff. let's get to the drink. What do you got yes. cooking on over there? Today, I have something called Be My Victim. Uh, that is a combination. I haven't tried this yet, as I always do the first drink. But this is a combination of honey liqueur, elderflower liqueur, and sunny delight. Because I thought, what is more appropriate for a beehive than elderflowers, honey, and sunniness. So let's give it a shot. You've never had this before. No, this, ooh. There you go. Oh, this well, is really that's nice. Usually a good, that's usually a good sign. And it's like honey whiskey, so I wasn't sure how this was going to go down, but this is really smooth. Awesome. Two and thumbs hey, up. Listen, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, point, we'll, put the, uh, we'll put the recipe on, online, of course, on our, on our Instagram account. Mm -hmm. If you want to make it at home, you can try it out for sure. Uh, and of course, drink responsibly and all that yep. stuff. Um, don't do anything we wouldn't do. Yeah, I, I'm drinking, uh, you know, we, <laughs> I, like I'm not advertising anything, but uh, I have a, a ridiculously sweet cider here, which I thought was pretty fitting, but it's cleverly hidden in my new 90s night Black Fawn Distro beer koozie. The so, best way uh, to not directly advertise for a brand. That's right. That's right. And if you're interested <laughs> in getting a 90s night beer koozie, uh, we'll let you know when you can do that because I haven't got it up on the store yet. So whatever. I'm behind. I'm behind. It'll get there. It'll but that's get because there. I've been doing so much of this uh, awesome programming with Casey, obviously from the Casey Ferguson show uh, as part of Halloween in May. So uh, pumped to be that. Uh, so, hey, listen, you'll get your beer koozies later. Nobody cares about those anyway, right? So, But for now, what we do have to discuss is the synopsis of Candyman. Yes. Do you have a do you have Absolutely. a physical? Now, Absolutely. yes, I do. So you know what? It's funny. And some people out there who might appreciate this, if you're if you're a, a collector of films, like sometimes you buy stuff and you forget that you buy it. And then you're like, oh man, like I like I really should watch that. Anyway, I I don't usually do that that often, but I had forgotten that I had replaced my Blu-ray copy of Candyman with the 4K edition of, uh, of Candyman from uh Scream Factory. Uh, always awesome, doing awesome work. And of course, this also features a whole ton of special features, uh, some of which were produced by our good friend and friend of the show, Heather Buckley. So a uh, quick shout out to Heather Buckley. If you haven't checked out her work, she's done a whole slew of featurettes and uh, behind the scenes uh, uh, special features for a whole host of uh, uh, movies on uh, Shout Factory, Scream Factory, Arrow and, and whatever. And also all those of course, factories. Of course, she was the producer of um, a bunch of films, including The Ranger and uh, just uh, just released a Sacrifice Game last year. So, uh, hey, shout out to Heather. I know she's listening. So uh, that's great. But uh, yeah, listen, let's jump into the uh, now. This isn't really a classic uh, synopsis, but we can get these from anywhere. But we like to go to the physical release because mm -hmm. they're usually the best. So here we go. Here's this. Here's the synopsis for Candyman. And this is my first time reading it. So uh, <laughs> buckle up. <laughs> the pressure's on. The pressure's on. OK, here we go. This gut-wrenching thriller follows a graduate student whose research summons the spirit of the dead. When Helen Lyle hears about Candyman, a slave spirit with a hook hand who is said to be said to haunt a notorious housing project, she thinks she has a new twist for her thesis. Braving the gang-ridden territory to visit the site, Helen arrogantly assumes Candyman can't really exist until he appears, igniting a string of terrifying grisly slayings. But the police don't believe in monsters and charge Helen with the crimes. And the only one who can set her free is Candyman. Now, I didn't count, but I was thinking about this. How many times? See, they only say it three times in, in the synopsis. That's good. Mm, we got to catch up another two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So, um, uh, you know, let's talk about the initial release of the film and we'll do yeah. all the uh, all the numbers and stuff. And then we'll get into the meat and potatoes of this movie and talk about the plot characters and uh, what we thought of the film. Yeah, absolutely. So this film was released by TriStar Pictures and Polygram Filmed Entertainment. It was theatrically released for the first time on October 16th, 1992. However, it did have its premiere at TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival, as part of the Midnight Madness lineup, which I love because that's one of my favorite film fests. Very so, cool. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, all, yeah, yeah. It's a nice Toronto Canadian tie-in, right? Little high fives to Toronto. Yeah. Uh, the production of the film occurred in Chicago. They actually did some filming in the Cabrini 
Cabrini Green. Yes, there we go. Cabrini Green uh, neighborhood that it's sort of actually set in. This is directed by Bernard Rose, written by Bernard Rose, based on the short story The Forbidden by Clive Barker. Stars Virginia Madsen, Tony Todd, Xander Berkeley, Casey Lemons, and Vanessa E. Williams. And also a little uh, a little feature in the trailer we saw from our, our little friend uh, Ted Raimi there. Ted Raimi, who I, I think in the movie is supposed to be a high school student. But uh, yes. or a college student, college student, a young fellow. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> I can't wait to get my casting call to play a uh, uh, um, a university student coming up. But uh, uh, yeah, and and also uh, super awesome that uh, Clive Barker. Obviously, it's based on his his short story, but yes. he's also his executive producer on the film, mm-hmm. which I think comes through. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But I do feel that comes through in Spades in much the same way that uh, I know he directed Hellraiser. Obviously, but you mm-hmm. really get that Clive Barker feel, especially mm. when it comes to the gore. And the sort of romanticism that's kind of weaved in and out of the violence in the film. So, um, yeah. So um, now let's talk uh, numbers. Let's talk some numbers. Yeah. So box office. um, So domestic box office for the film was twenty five point seven million. Of course, it was nineteen ninety two. There wasn't a lot of of international box office. So that's your total twenty five point seven. But the budget was only eight or sorry eight to nine million. So let's say nine million dollars estimated. Of course, all numbers are in USD, and um, so it was a moderate success. And of course. um, this movie did phenomenal on uh, VHS and home video when it hit because it did kind of gather a sort of a following. And, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well, because I got a kind of a funny story about that when it came out as well. So now um, the runtime now we're in 39 minutes. Um, now this, um, this uh, uh, director's cut um, or the unrated cut actually was uh, included on the Blu-ray uh, on Shout Factory a couple years ago um, or Scream Factory, sorry. It was on there a couple of years ago. Now they've redone it in 4K. They did restore one of the scenes that was cut for ratings purposes. Uh, and it was that's now re-included. Now everyone's seen that from a couple of years ago, but it's in 4K and it does look better. It looks a little bit more seamless now uh, than I remember watching it a couple of years ago. So that's really cool. It's a it's 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 an awesome scene too. So currently the film is 79% on Rotten Tomatoes with 81 reviews. So I don't know if it's underrated, but uh, the critical consensus reads though it ultimately sacrifices some mystery in the name of gory thrills. Candyman is a nuanced, effectively chilling tale that benefits from an interesting premise and some fine performances. So there we go. There's the uh, box office numbers. Kels, you got some stuff on the, um, uh, on the marketing of the film. What do you got over there? Yeah, so there's a couple of different taglines associated with this movie. The first one, I believe, was on the classic poster, We Dare You to Say His Name Five Times. Always good to have a call to action in your uh, marketing. Uh, You don't have to believe, just beware, which I appreciate that one. Uh, Candyman, 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 don't say it again. Nice. And the very uh, basic, from the chilling imagination of Clive Barker, gets right to the point. Of course. And I think that they were kind of on the trailer that we showed at the top. uh, That's like, uh, there's a line in there that I feel like was maybe a discarded uh, tagline, which is... uh, like find out, find out who's behind the mirror or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, listen, I love that trailer. I love that trailer. Ooh. It's very like, it's got that nineties. Like, I don't know how to make that sound effect, but you know, exactly <laughs> the sound effect I'm thinking about right now. It's like, the, yeah. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Like I, I can't it sound like a monkey doing it, but like um, it's, it's like, it, it's something, I don't know how you explain it, but anyway, it's sort of like the nineties version of like the foghorn thing that they were mm, the bwah, you know, that is a thing now like yeah. so um but if anyone has a name for that uh you know let us know like like you know hit us up on instagram leave it leave a comment below in the video um or call the studio or email casey <laughs> tell casey about what you think that noise is what and that we'll try sound and incorporate is. that into future videos or future reviews um now uh now formats like i've just said we ch- yeah. checked it on 4k um kel's you know, I'm, I'm assuming it, it wasn't 4K. I'm assuming it's a lesser quality format. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I purchased it online. I think it was, I want to say Amazon Prime for this one um, because I was impatient and I wanted to watch it immediately and I didn't physically own a nice copy of it. So I bought it for streaming. Okay. But I do have to get like, a, a, yeah. here's the thing is I'm not going to get a 4K because I don't have a 4K TV. So there's no point in me investing in this type of physical media until I can support it. That's my argument. That but I'm at least with. you're supporting it 
in one way, shape, or form, exactly. which is great. And uh, exactly. you should do that if you actually love movies the way we love movies as well. So now I got to say, I remember when this movie came out and uh, it was sort of like, we didn't really hear about it in the theaters. Like, I don't know how long the run was in the theaters, but we kind of heard about it. Like you saw the commercials or something and you were like, well, Candyman, mm -hmm. Candyman. But I do remember when it, um, it, like the older kids, like in my high school, uh, I don't even think I was in high school at the time, uh, probably on the, on the verge, but we like the older kids that were in high school, they were saying stuff like, Oh, don't say his name like five times in the, in the mirror. And I just kind of got around in much the same way, like that other urban legends get around. Right. So, so mm. we would go to the bathroom and like, and like look in the mirror and say it four times and see who would chicken out and stuff. And I, I distinctly remember doing that with my buddy and then also like not wanting to do it as well. Cause I was like, <laughs> I just like, I, you just don't know what's going to happen. Like, I don't know. Like, so I didn't see the movie. I hadn't even, I didn't even really know about the movie. Just people were mm. like, dude, there's this guy, he's got a hook for an arm and he's like, don't oh, say it. Don't say the name. You'll kill you. Right. <laughs> so like I was uh, like, so I was kind of like, like, not terrified, but I was scared. I was scared of Candyman for sure. So when I saw You're the movie, cautious. I was like, man, like it's, and it's awesome. It's an awesome flick. So that was my, that was my sort of introduction to the, to the character and to the, to the film. Um, Kels, uh, any fond memories that you remember when you saw it the first time at all, or? Uh, as with most cases, I don't remember the first time I saw it. It was definitely not in theaters because I was five and I don't think they would have let mm. me in. Um, not suitable but... for five-year-olds. <laughs> Unsuitable for five-year-old me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I did see, I think I was probably in like high school or university when I saw it for the first time when I was um, first kind of diving into into horror movies a little bit more. Um, I think it was just like one of those things like we were watching, it must have been like a Halloween party or something as you do when you just want something that again carries that creep factor, that uh, that urban legend factor of, you know, you say it in the bathroom mirror and chaos ensues. And I was, there was probably some sort of... Um, be my victim drinks involved that um I'm, I'm sure we ran to the bathroom and said it at some point i don't know if we got to five times probably not because i'm still here but uh yeah i don't but remember unfortunately right. unfortunately i'm unfortunately. not dead <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah it, that uh i think that was it was probably the first time i saw it was just at a uh, a social gathering i would say Okay, well, like, let's dive in. <laughs> like, like that's the preamble. That's what we do every episode, just to give yes. you some background on the film when it came out and all that stuff. Now, let's get into like, let's get into the nitty gritty. Let's get into the weeds on this one because I really do feel that this movie is sort of a perfect combination of creative people working on it. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, like, I mean, I think uh, Tony Todd is one of the quintessential like boogeyman in, yes. in, in film as, as a bad guy, as Candyman. I think he's, he's ultimately um, super memorable. And I think I, like, when I say underrated as a film, like I just don't think he gets the credit that let's say like, uh, like Freddy Krueger or, or Jason gets. And I'm, and, and I'm mm -hmm. not talking about Tony Todd, the actor, I'm actually just talking about the character, but I really do feel like he's it. it and I think it's just the franchise kind of got, a little botched after this like they they mm. tried to turn it into something and it 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 didn't really work it was more of a straight to video thing and i think that it just didn't capture and and roll with that sort of franchise tag that some of the other um um you know horror icons did in in you know, of course throughout the 80s so mm -hmm. um but having said that um let's talk about tony todd cuz yes. i love that guy and uh he's so awesome in this role he's so convincing he's so um he's such a complete character uh as far as a villain goes um where he has depth and a story to him and um you know motive and growth as well as, as far as a, a bad guy goes it's it, it's pretty it's pretty impressive especially for 92. yeah i i think it's wild that originally they had planned to have uh eddie murphy was the original choice for this role but apparently they couldn't afford him but that's a rumor they say is denied by the director but he was of the original choice for the role um which mm. is bananas so I, I i think that tony todd is definitely the right uh choice in terms of bringing the gravitas of it like he has a, he's theatrically trained he's a classic actor um he has this sort of classic composition to the role and I, I appreciate that he saw in this character this this kind of comparison to like phantom of the opera hunchback of notre dame these like monsters that use uh both like terror and tenderness 
um, to try and win over the love of a, of a female protagonist. And he seems to really kind of understand the complexity of this character, that he is a tragic figure. He's, you know, he's a serial killer in a way, but he also has this really tragic backstory. And I think Tony Todd does a wonderful job of actually bringing that to the forefront. So he is a sympathetic villain at the same time. Yeah, because he his because I think if you compare him to other, some other characters throughout uh, film, especially the '90s, like his story is could very easily become like one of vengeance, and he could easily be the hero in the story. Absolutely. Um, and I think that you 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 made a point about um, uh, a great point we were talking before we got on the air, but like about his shoes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and do you want to talk about? Because I I actually. I didn't actually notice that to be honest, but it's funny because I had a note as well tying into shoes. So, but you go like, what did you like? Explain yeah. You, so I, I, I noticed when he's walking in the parking garage, when he kind of first had that introduction between him and, and, and Helen, when they first kind of have that meeting, um, you see, and you hear Helen's footsteps as she's walking through this concrete parking garage, but the candy man's, just silent. Like he's walking, but it has close-ups on his feet. So you see him walking, but it's completely devoid of that sound of his footsteps. You just hear hers, which has this really kind of supernatural mythological uh, element to it that it just kind of, he seems just not quite real. He's very like fantastical that way. He's just kind of, you know, almost like a figment of your imagination, but he does exist. He is physically there. So I just thought that was such a cool, creepy detail. Um, I, that I, I think is just such a nifty way to introduce that character and, and and highlight the fact that he is not quite of this world anymore. Yeah. And I thought um, like when you mentioned that it, it's kind of, it, it, it jogged something in my, my mind too. Cause I, I had a note about how awesome the backstory is and it's tragic mm-hmm. and it's brutal and it's, it's sad uh, ultimately. Um, but, but it, it is complex. Like it's not just a thing they, I always feel like in the eighties and nineties, they put like a little bit of thought into this stuff. And yeah. um, I know we compare nineties movies to current movies all the time. I feel like sometimes we don't get that backstory at all. Like what's this guy's deal or what's this gal's deal? Like what, what mm-hmm. is the, what's this character being through? Like, where have they come from? You have a really clear understanding. They do it in kind of a clever way where it's, um, um, you know, they establish Helen and, and she's talking to like uh her husband Trevor's friend who's this sort of pompous you know <laughs> professor at dinner mm-hmm. and uh who I think is a funny character but um and he said well I'm the expert basically like look at all this stuff I know and it's like he's a he's a he's kind of like this yeah like I said he's this pompous arrogant kind of guy and he laughs in her face because she's doing her thesis on Candyman um but also as well he does know some stuff and he kind of explains to it so so it kind of gives it some some credibility um mm-hmm. because they do seem like facts as far as how the legend is, 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 is created. But in there, he says, um, uh, that his father, Candyman's father was like a, like a, basically he made a machine that made shoes or something like in mm-hmm. that, which is such a throwaway detail. And one that you're like, well, that doesn't really have anything to do with Candyman, but it does tie mm-hmm. into the idea that he was almost like, um, he was in the upper echelon of society. Like he was almost right. like an aristocrat. When you mentioned that about the shoes, it's like, is that because the shoes are so well made? They're mm. so soft that they don't make any noise. I don't know, but hey. Ooh, the plot that, that's, that's just what I thought when you mentioned yeah. it. I didn't notice the shoes. <laughs> I was like, I was still focused on um, uh, a couple other things. Uh, I think one of the really, so, and, and the reason I missed that, the thing that I noticed is that Candyman actually doesn't show up until the halfway point in this movie. And I think that's huh. so important. Mm -hmm. Um, because you hear him, but you don't see him. Like you hear the stories about him. Yeah. um, The, that the kind of the fake candy man, that sort of, uh, you know, he, he's the, the imposter candy man that we're using the legend to scare the residents and keep them in line, um, around, uh, Cabrini green. Um, like he's not candy man. You don't ever see him until that parking lot scene. And, yeah, um, he's just kind of the whispers in the wind before that, which is yeah, mm, and that's so fun about going going yeah, that's that's what's so fun about going back and watching these movies because you never think about that when you first see them because we were kids, right? So yeah, um, and if you, when you when you watch it, it's like, it is very much like um, it is very much like uh, let's say like Jaws or other films that the monster kind of you gives it some time to show up and become this mm-hmm. threatening thing. Um, Tony Todd as well. Like, like I've met him in person. 
at you know at a couple of comic cons and whatever he's a, he's a super imposing figure like oh he is, yeah he is like a massive dude and yeah uh, like you look up to him and um uh <laughs> i remember a funny story like i was like uh we were at a convention once and and we just got into an elevator there are all these people going into an elevator so i just got into an elevator and like the elevator had all mirrors in, <laughs> inside and tony todd sitting standing at the back <laughs> of the elevator like just going up to his room or whatever yeah like we got into the thing and i was just like the doors closed and i said okay nobody get any ideas okay like, <laughs> like seriously and he chuckled right in the back and i was ah it's good. yeah so but uh yeah he's uh, in that scene as well like um uh, what's crazy to me is like kind of the scene after that is this is 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 a pretty wild scene because it's the it's the murder scene the first murder right yeah um where she wakes up and she's in the apartment and uh yeah i mean i don't know what's going to get censored on radio so i just want to be careful here but like uh basically yeah there's 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 a dog that doesn't make it and mm -hmm. uh there's a baby that goes missing and there's a lot of blood in that scene yeah uh, if you go to does the dog die.com the answer is yes that's right that's right yeah which is, which is a site that i believe just warns you if they're if it a dog does is gonna, it does die, yeah right so mm -hmm. but it's a crazy scene because it's such a dreamlike sequence that that when you first meet Candyman and you're like, oh, well, maybe he isn't that threatening. Maybe he's just, you know, <laughs> and then it good. cuts this other scene and it's absolute mayhem. Yeah. Uh, and it's a very visceral scene as well. You don't necessarily see uh, a, a lot of the violence. It's just the aftermath. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, I think the film, as soon as he shows up, flips pretty convincingly um, from, from the first half of the film, which is sort of this like, research thesis thing right over to like complete madness and a spiral into insanity mm -hmm. um with an excellent performance from vanessa e williams too like her reaction in that scene when she you know when when helen kind of wakes up and and Anne marie mccoy is just losing it is 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 fascinating like she does such an incredible job of just conveying how uh traumatized and how horrific this whole scene is so you just wake up to hear her screaming and you know blood all over the floor and it's a really impactful scene because like you said you're just kind of coming out of this very um somewhat romantic dreamy sequence and and you think like oh maybe he's just you know kind of a, a brooding bad boy type of type of character but no he's he's pretty he's pretty violent <laughs> <Brooding> <laughs> <It's> bad boy <laughs> well, <laughs> well, he does have a hook for a hand he does have a hook you know it's that's it's that's pretty that's pretty bad boy behavior right there i think <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I did Noted. <laughs> bad voice. Take note. Um, I, I did an interview with Tony Todd a couple years back when he did, uh, tales from the hood three and, uh, I get talking about like his, his presence and, 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 um, that he is theatrically trained in. and he, I love that he kind of like brought a lot of his theater training into this. And he had like a lot of, um, inspirations from different characters from like plays and from theater which is really 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 lovely and and uh he kind of doesn't really think of like himself as being a horror icon which is precious to me because he's he's so iconic and he's such especially in this role like he terrified a whole generation uh made us afraid to say things in the mirror five times and and did so in a way that also kind of made him a little bit sympathetic and made a little bit uh dramatically terrifying but also just you just wanted to know more i feel like the whole time i'm watching Candyman, like i'm like mentally and emotionally like leaning in just trying to like learn more about him because he's so fascinating and such a compelling character even for not you know showing up until 44 minutes under the film yeah you you really get a sense that um he's uh he he is this this omnipotent force that's coming yeah. to terrorize these people but you're not really kind of told how. And mm -hmm. and I, I love about this film is that even at the start, like, like even at the start where there's like, there's all the bees on the screen mm -hmm. and the bees sort of like, they, they sort of invade, which is a really cool effect for 92, by the way. Um, yeah. Sort of in, in invade Chicago, the Chicago skyline, but you never really like, we know it cause we've seen the movie a bunch of times. Right. But if you were just watching that movie in the theater, you'd be like, wait a sec. So how does this all tie in? And you're kind of like, you've given these breadcrumbs, um, these little this, these little morsels throughout the first half of the film about who he is and and how terrifying he is and whether or not it's 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 um there's a word I want to use but I can't but 
whether or not it's nonsense, whether or not it's just a fable and folklore and just something made mm -hmm. up to scare kids and stuff. And then you find out that, and, and I, which I think is great um, because he says, uh, uh, you know, because like no one believes in me anymore and that's yeah. I have to come back and do something horrific. So people believe. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, ah, I like that a lot. <laughs> like yeah. I think that's a really good setup. Um, For sure. But, like uh, Helen's whole line of dialogue that she says, like, an entire community starts attributing the daily horrors of their lives to a mythical figure. And that's kind of what it's based on and what it's perceived as. But he's so much more than that. So like I, like you said, I love that he comes back and kind of has to prove himself still relevant, still violent, still terrifying. So uh, we're just going to throw up a few as we kind of get into the because there's a couple other things I want to talk about, too, on, with the mm -hmm. cast. But uh, for the benefit of our uh, viewers that are watching at home and uh, that are uh, sorry, sorry, radio listeners, but uh, um, we don't uh, we, we're going to just throw up a few stills, but we'll try and explain them as we throw them up just so you know what you're what we're looking at. Uh, mm -hmm. But of course, the first one here is 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 a really nice black and white still um, of, of course, Virginia Madsen and uh, as Helen and um, and Tony Todd as Candyman. Uh, you kind of get like what I was just saying, just the, the size, the size of size of that guy is, uh, yeah. is you know, he's must be six, five. Uh, he is. And he is. He is right? right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I guess, um, yeah. I think but, this, uh, from what I understand too, they, uh, that Bernard Rose had them take like ballroom dancing classes together, Tony Todd and uh, Virginia Madsen. So they would kind of have that um, like romanticized connection and you really kind of see it in this particular shot where they're kind of gazing into each other's eyes um, and just have this hypnotic connection. Yeah. Um, and it, it does. Uh, and speaking of the, the uh, hypnosis. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so the director, uh, Bernard Rose, um, he actually, the, so he, they actually uh, um, hypnotized Virginia Madsen. Mm -hmm. um, anytime that kind of candy man shows up to give her this sort of like, it's like almost like she's got a, this sort of vacant sort of dreamlike stare um it's really it it's really awesome now i will preface this by saying like in the special features on the on on the uh on the on the blu-ray um they do ask virginia madsen about that and she says i was a younger actress then and <laughs> very very um you know and she kind of she smiles, but she's like, it wouldn't be something she would do today. And yeah. you can talk about whether or not maybe they should have done it or not. I, I don't know what the answer is there, to be honest. Um, but uh, because you, you wouldn't see that in a movie today. Mm -mm. However, I would say that the what they capture on screen is is really, really cool. And, and I do have a still of that, too, where she's sort of like she does sort of almost have this vacant look in her face, but but not but not really. It's like this. It's not really how people look. Right. Because people aren't walking around hypnotized all the time yeah. unless I'm, unless I'm missing something, but um, yeah, it was interesting. What are your thoughts on that? Kels? I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know how to feel about it. Cause I feel like it's like, well, if everyone's cool with it, but again, yeah, I do yeah. know that people can kind of get, you know, influenced doing things. Maybe they're not totally comfortable with, but I don't know. Right. I, I from, from what I understand, and I don't know how much of this is, is true, but from what I understand, they, definitely did the hypnosis thing. And I think at one point during filming, she's like, can we stop that? Cause it feels like a little bit weird to do it. But I think that, you know, I'm of two minds with it on the one hand, like it kind of creates this almost uh, like method way of really connecting into this being inside yourself or outside yourself or not quite present in yourself <laughs> moment for, for Helen Lyle. Um, and I think as long as it's something she's okay with, then that's a really kind of cool and interesting way to achieve that effect. But I think, again, as soon as she has that moment of like, oh, maybe let's not do this. It's the fact that they're like, okay, we're going to take a step back. We're going to stop. We're not going to do that is is good that they didn't, you know, twist her arm and be like, no, 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 no. You got to keep doing this. Right. We're going yeah, yeah. to, yeah. so I, I do respect that they respected her and were, you know, taking a step back from that when she, when she expressed um, hesitation. Yeah. And and I like the fact that she mentioned that too, in the special features, I think it does kind of pull the curtain back a little bit and, sure. and also just communicate just to people like us who might not, might not know this is, is just like how they actually did that. And also like how she actually felt about it both then and now. And I think that's important too, to, to reflect on that stuff and just set it up for anybody else who might be, who might be, you know, getting to acting and stuff and just, you know, whatever, putting it on their radar. So, yeah. um, now I will say um, one thing I did think about too in those scenes because I was paying attention to them uh, while I was watching the movie did kind of remind me of um, uh, Mia Goth in um, Pearl. Uh, 
I, I just something about it. I don't know. Just just felt like it was kind of almost like same sort of like half vacant look. Yeah. Um, which uh, which I think like obviously Mia Goth's um, her monologue in uh, in. Uh, oh my gosh! Is, you know, <gasps> one of the, we got to do a hot stove. One of the greats. Listen, we got to do a hot stove from hell, which is our it'll panel be five discussion. hours long. I will love it. <laughs> and maybe we'll do it on uh, when Maxine comes out. Yes, I think that. I was just going to say that would be a perfect time to do it. I think when Maxine is released uh, on the world. Now. Um, you got some information about the bees, right? Because the bees are such a big part part of the film. And yeah. Tony Todd, obviously, they used real bees, which I think, you know, if they made, I don't know, like if they made the exact version of the movie, they would be digital, and they kind of did in the in the in the reboot call or sequel or whatever you want to call it. But uh, yeah. um, but talk to us about the bees because they did actually use live bees on 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 this set. They point. did. Yeah. I, I Whenever I hear like the conversation of the bees, I think of like a combination to, between like Nicolas Cage's Wicker Man and that like uh, ancient aliens guys where he's like aliens. Like I just imagine like bees is what I get in my head specifically <laughs> from a made up meme. <laughs> anyway. Jonathan Frakes talking. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, just, never, yeah, exactly. Never happened. It never happened. But uh, so the Don't bees were, <laughs> were actually uh, were bred specifically for this movie because they needed to make sure that they were only, I think, like 12, 10 or 12 hours old. So they looked like mature bees, but their stinger wouldn't be powerful enough to do any real damage, which is something I didn't realize about bees is that, I mean, it makes perfect sense. But if they're not fully mature, that stinger isn't going to be as damaging. That said... Apparently, Tony Todd negotiated a bonus of uh, of uh, you know thousand dollars for every bee sting he suffered during filming. He was stung twenty three times, um, so he did joke that he had a, a very good uh, a very good lawyer, a very good contract when when it came to the bee stings. I think over the course of the Candyman franchise, he said he was stung twenty six times or something. I've heard twenty three and twenty six tossed around equally, um, but you know, kudos because. That's a lot of commitment. And, and I understand that they, uh, for the scenes when both him and Helen are, are covered in bees, they were told, you know, basically like bear rules, just like stay calm, don't panic, just chill. If you're calm, they're calm. And, and they had to take, I think, about like 45 minutes to remove the bees after the bees were applied. So once the scene's over, it's just sort of them just lying there, just frozen, waiting for them to take this tiny little vacuum and come and like safely remove the bees from them uh, with this really? tiny little device that they use to to remove uh, the bees, which is bananas. And uh, I don't think I would be comfortable with five bees walking across me. I think that would take a little bit um, of, of convincing. What about, but... four? what about four bees though? Well, I mean, if they're not mature bees, four might be okay. I think apparently, actually, uh, Virginia Madsen was allergic to bees, and so she she told the director this, and he's like, "Nah, no, nah, you're fine. Go go get an allergy test." So she got one done and it discovered she was more allergic to wasps. I think. So they're like, "Okay, we'll just yeah, we'll just we'll just make sure we got some stuff on hand. Like, you'll be fine. It'll be fine." <laughs> I don't know if she got stung ever. You only hear about Tony Todd being stung, so jury's still out on that one. But uh, but good for her for facing that fear for the sake of the film because she just wanted to do the role. And wanted to do the film because it's such a a, a fascinating story and, and, and compelling story. Uh, now, I would say uh, as well, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to a couple of people who worked on the film. Um, no, not that I know them, but like the, the bees. I don't. I don't look. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> e and, shout out uh, to the bees. <laughs> BB and <laughs> BB and Phoebe. Bobby and Billy. Uh, <laughs> Bronson. Bruno. Anyway, so anyway, so uh, but I would say um, uh, my just a, a quick shout out to uh, both the set design, whoever designed yes. the sets, whoever scattered the locations for the fi this film is just mm -hmm. a still open screen here of when uh, when Helen goes through the uh, through Candy Can Candyman's mouth, uh, which is or the big um, uh, the big uh, painting that's on the wall, mm -hmm. and also whoever locations scattered this movie. Of course, they shot it in Chicago. And uh, it really does bring like that side of the city to life. Uh, it's a very kind of rundown sort of um, gritty movie. And I think I appreciate that. I appreciate they didn't try to make it to um, like, there's definitely a, a um, there's definitely a, 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 a comparison or, or a, um, like there's two, two sides of the same coin happening in this movie all the time between characters and locations and, and uh, you know, social status and in mm. you know Even all the kinds color of stuff. palette yeah um but uh and but i mean just 
jumping back to, uh, I think there's a lot of really cool uh, things that they do. Also, we always forget about this, and I, I wanted to make sure we didn't this time, is that uh, the, the, the score in this movie is absolutely <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, of course, Philip Glass, who is, yes. uh, you know, a legendary legend yeah um and this score is so good and it really does kind of you know it's almost like whenever that piano score comes in it sounds very Mm -hmm. very almost like a music box without sounding like a music box if that makes any sense and um it doesn't beat you over the head with anything and i think like in the film uh like the plot wise like I, i really do feel like they do a really great job of like marrying like the brutality and the violence in the film with this other sort of dreamlike world. Um, they do that with sort of like the economic disparity between what's happening at in, in Cabrini green and mm-hmm. what's happening in the other um, like More the affluent. society. Yeah, affluent yeah. Society, even so much that like her apartment building is the same design built by the same kind of company or same architect as Cabrini green. Like there's very much, there's, there's, there's these two sort of like um, mirrors, ironically enough of, of like, you know, of these two worlds. And I think that really plays well. And I think the score plays into that. The characters play into that and everything. And I think it's one of the, one of the best things about the movie and what makes it so watchable and rewatchable after all these years. Yeah, I just had a thought as well, coming back to like the design and the the set design and, and the color palette that they use. Cabrini Green is very like strong, bold colors, very bright and colorful. Whereas when we first kind of are in Helen Lyle's uh, apartment, it's very like beige and very uh, muted tones. And, and um, it's interesting. I just thought of this when um, Helen, you know, first has that incident in Cabrini Green and she's sent to, uh, to be processed. Um, and she comes back to her apartment. Um, they're painting at these bright, it's like bright blue and bright pink. And that's when the candy men sort of start to bleed into her real life. Yeah. Or her, her home life, I guess, is kind of echoed by this, this sudden like splash of color over her previously drab life slash apartment. So just something I thought of now that that's an interesting uh, mirror. Yeah. I think the um, mirrors. Uh, and 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 I will say this too. I think ultimately, every time I watch this movie, I'm always reminded that Trevor is the actual villain of the yes. film. Right? He's the actual. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can't monster. Swear, He's the monster face. of the film. The monster of the film. Yeah. Like what a jerk, eh? What a what a. Can I say d bag? Can I say that? I think so. I think that's okay. fine. Because you're not. There's no, I'm word. not swearing. <laughs> Yeah, he's a, he's he's a he's a jerk face. He's yeah, a jerk. he's a no good, good for nothing. So and so, so and so piece <laughs> of work that guy. Yeah, I think. Uh, professor. <laughs> why I oughta? I All think right. so. Let's get a let's let's jump let's pivot a bit because we got to wrap yeah. this thing up. We don't want to keep yes. everyone listening to too long. Hopefully, hopefully you've enjoyed the show. And of course, if you're listening as part of the Halloween in May, um, presented by the Casey Ferguson show, um, please keep listening. They've got tons of programming coming up. We might be kicking around uh, for you know throughout the weekend. And also, of course, if you're catching the rerun of this, which we broadcast on our YouTube channel, uh, give us a subscribe, give us a like, maybe drop a comment down below. Let us know what you'd like to us to review next and of course follow us on social media our handle is at black font distro on all of the all of the websites wherever you consume and are addicted to your social mm-hmm. media gatherings will be there as well so give us a follow um let's talk about quotes kels yeah, you got some yeah. favorite quotes in this movie because it's full of them and it's one of I, those quotable horror films i think and i think that's another reason it's underrated a bit yes because everyone talks freddy and all the blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. this movie has awesome killer quotes in it as well what do you got yeah very very clive barker and some of these quotes very theatrical and some of these quotes kind of shakespearean some of these quotes as well Mm -hmm. the ones that really stuck out to me are all lines from the candy man himself and i think again it speaks to that very kind of gothic theatricality and 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 uh and emotion so the first one is the classic i am the writing on the wall the whisper in the classroom without these things i am nothing so now i must shed innocent blood come with me mm. shivers so yeah, lovely that's awesome uh the next cool. one so cool <laughs> the next one longer one but i just again equally uh 
very cool to me. The pain, I can assure you, will be exquisite. As for our deaths, there is nothing to fear. Our names will be written on a thousand walls. Our crimes told and retold by our faithful believers. We shall die together in front of their very eyes and give them something to be haunted by. Come with me and be immortal. She's like, that's such a... Spoken like a true bad boy. I know, right? I was going to say that would work on me 100%. If some guy like slid into my DMs, it was like, listen, the pain, I can assure you, will be exquisite. I'd be like, sweet. Let's. let's hey, careful what you wish for, Kel. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the last one that I have that I highlighted was, you were not content with the stories, so I was obliged to come, which is a, such a chilling line, too. I just, mm. he's such a chilling bad boy, that candy man. So that, that your last one was, mm. was something similar that I had. I, mm. I like the one where he's explaining to her why he's there which is um which he says a couple times right but he's he kind of he echoes this right where he says your belief destroyed the faith in my congregation without them i am nothing so i was obliged to come and now i must kill you yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Like, that's metal um, yeah that's heavy metal man <laughs> you, listen if i say that quote if you take that quote and anyone reads it and you put like a, a like a crushing riff behind it yeah that's heavy metal let me tell you that's metal guys so i feel like you could take a lot of the lines from this put a crushing riff behind it and it would just make a <gasps> should have had banger. a crushing riff we should have we should have where do we we need crushing riffs i get we need we gotta, a crushing riff that we can play while we say this stuff but right, I'll, I'll call kevin get him to rip something together real fast yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah well here's another one here um uh is uh another right at the start we said uh, they will say I have shed innocent blood. Again, another echo. What's blood for if not if not for shedding? Oh, and shredding uh, more like air guitar. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and like, um, and uh, <laughs> uh, I like. Um, it's time for a new miracle. I like that's that line. Mm -hmm. But I also got to close with uh, "Be my victim." Classic, classic line. I love it. Classic. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so we've only got a few minutes, so I think what we should do is we should toss this up and say, do we want to do interesting facts and tie-ins, or do you want to do legacy of the can legacy of the franchise, legacy of the film? Mm -hmm. um, I have movie? one interesting factoid that I thought was fascinating as a true oh, yeah, crime yeah. nerd. Okay, so apparently when investigating one of the Candyman's crime scenes, you know, Helen and Bernadette discover the design, like that medicine cabinet comes out of the wall to make it you know, there's an intruder can enter in. This wasn't actually made up. There was a uh, a, a case in uh, Chicago Abbott, Chicago's Abbott Homes housing project in 1987, Ruthie May McCoy, which interesting that the character in the film was, I think, Ruthie Marie McCoy. Yeah. That's um, yeah. yeah. But she has, uh, she was killed by an intruder who entered her apartment through an opening behind the bathroom's medicine cabinet. So that was actually based on a true thing, which is terrifying. And now I have to check all of my bathroom cabinets. Yeah. Yeah. Who's, who's, who's behind there? Yeah. And Time if you're at out. home right now, <laughs> you should probably go do the same. But go while you're in there, friends. <laughs> don't say Candyman five times. Yeah. Or do wait for them to duke it out when the intruder comes through the cabinet that's another option see it very very easily very easily yeah. could be it could be he could be a hero in this movie. yeah um okay so I, <laughs> <laughs> let's talk legacy <laughs> we're remaking the movie okay guys we're remaking it he's gonna be a good guy troubled um I bad feel, boy <laughs> yeah i do feel um like as well, like just going back to Tony Todd as well, how how significant mm -hmm. he is as a um, you know as a black actor playing this villainous role and getting serious credit for it too. Yeah, and I think that um, I know that there's there there is some. There, I think Bernard Rose was he was conflicted a little bit, or he wasn't conflicted, but the studio was conflicted a bit, and yes. and people were like scared that it would be, paint uh, Tony Todd in a, in a negative light and stuff like that. But I feel mm -hmm. like I feel like. I don't want to get too controversial here because I'm not trying to be, but I just feel like because they weren't thinking about that, mm -hmm. really, it doesn't come across like that. And I think they just didn't overthink it. And I'm, I, I mean, Bernard Rose says he he had a lot of meetings about it. He they were they were cognizant of it, but probably not when they wrote the script. And um, they were just, I guess, kind of careful as when they filmed it. But I do feel like it wasn't this persistent thing. I don't think when they were developing yeah. this movie. Or the story. Obviously, the story was adapted. Um, the, st the original story by Clive Barker takes place in England. 
Liverpool. Liverpool. Um, and then it was adapted and moved to Chicago for the film. Um, and Bernard Rose optioned the rights because he, he him and Clive Barker were like buddies, right? Like they were mm-hmm. good friends. So, um, but I just feel like they didn't really approach. It wasn't, it wasn't in that, like that those thoughts weren't kind of in there when they were making it. They just wanted a villainous person. And like everything that you said, Kel's like with him, Tony Todd being classically trained, he's an imposing physical presence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he really just delivers this. And I think, in much the same way where he plays um, uh, the coroner in uh, the final destination movies, he's yeah. just, he just does the right amount of stuff. And I'm, I'm glad that he's remembered. It seems like a really humble guy when you talk to him, but I, I'm glad he's getting, I, I'm glad that, that, that role has stood the test of time. Right. I think it's important. Yeah. And I think that an interesting point to bring up is, is you know, speaking of Clive Barker and the original story set in Liverpool is that the original character of the Candyman is described as like his flesh was waxy and yellow. His thin lips were a pale blue. Um, he, like he's described as having like a red beard. I think like he's not a person of color in, in the, the original story. But I think the really fascinating thing was that by changing this location from Liverpool to Chicago it seems racially motivated, but more than that, it's poverty motivated. It's all about kind of the economic disparity yeah. of, these, of these regions, which is also what the original story is set in Liverpool is, has that same theme. But by setting it in the States and in, in America, where certainly there's a lot of uh, uh, economic disparity, shall we say, and a lot of um, uh, heated arguments about that, rightfully so, um, it seems like a very appropriate place to hold this story and to bring forward um you know, to, to have this um, character that challenges those ideas and challenges what it means to um, be a dangerous, quote unquote, unquote, person in this community. So I think it's, you know, it's it's kind of an interesting way that they reworked it, repurposed it and made it relevant for different reasons. And it's funny you should mention that, too, because I really do feel that that's why it stood the test of time. Yeah. Like this movie doesn't feel like it was you couldn't watch it now and take away the same, the same things. Um, And I think you're right. I think the economic disparity, and I think that's sort of underlined very skillfully. Like in, I I, I think that the housing, like like the actual buildings, right. One is Mm -hmm. this fancy pants condo and the other one is like the projects, right. Like, and and they say, well, you know, this building has access. I think I can't remember exactly. I'm paraphrasing, but this building has access to the highway, whereas the other one doesn't. Doesn't it's boxed in, so they could keep like the projects over there, and we can yeah. turn this into a condo building and make some cash. Like that's the, that's the, that's the, that's what they're doing. And funny enough, um, as a throwback to in our '90s night, our very first episode we ever did, it did remind me some of the conversations about that reminded me of American Psycho, yeah. where they're sort of like you know, this is sort of the, the economic echelon of our society is built upon all of these other people dying and other, the, mm-hmm. the, the suffering, suffering of others, I guess. Right. So yeah. um, I think it's very, um, I, I think, I, I don't think they're trying to do anything um, funny. There's not, no, it's, there's, there's no sleight of hand here. Um, mm-hmm. I, I really do feel like it's, uh, and, and again, I think um, uh, even Trevor's story arc uh, as yeah. a character of someone who just takes, 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 and, and realizes that, that, that was probably not the right decision um, at the end kind of plays into his sort of, uh, you know, position in society where he's in this top kind of, you know, um, affluent bubble at the top where nothing really affects him uh, until the end. And then he realizes that. Yeah. Spoiler surprise. Mm-hmm. You're dead. <laughs> and I think the the other thing about the oral storytelling element of this as well, and especially, you know, how when you look at the the characters in the film that are kind of discussing like, oh, this is the lore of the Candyman. It's a, this, you know, they're having this conversation at a rich dinner party in a fancy restaurant. It's it's this, you know, white affluent folks that are saying like, oh, you don't go to Cabrini Green. That's dangerous. You don't go there. Yeah. It's, 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 it's kind of like this projection of like, you know, it's, it's dangerous over there. It's, it's hazardous over there, but it's, it's a different experience than the community that actually live in Cabrini Green, their understanding of that folklore, I guess, and the way that they kind of work that folklore. So yeah. What was that guy's name? Trevor? Trevor is a jerk is, is kind yeah, of what it, it all comes back to. And the guy who like looked so much like, um, uh, Steven, um, oh my gosh. Uh-oh. I'm going to forget his name. I have to think about it. It's going to come to me yeah. at like three o'clock in the morning. I'll remember. I'll be like, oh yeah, that guy. Like Stephen Root? No. Not Stephen Root. 
But the guy at the table, the the the, the yeah, other, the I other know guy exactly you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Thank I you. Know, but I can't. I can't. I, I, right I, now, when like, I watched the movie, I was like trying to think of. Uh, uh, it's. Uh, I don't know. He's like a very famous atheist. British he actor. Talks, yeah. He, yeah. He's right? in Harry Potter. What's his name? I know that doesn't narrow that it down, up. but <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna look this up. I'm gonna track this down in like so, three seconds. It's so gonna jump come in to when me. you find it. Um, Stephen yeah, Fry. I, Stephen Fry. Thank there you. we go. He um, looks so much like Stephen Fry to me. He does. Anyways, he to be like maybe he's from. his brother. His twin brother. Bob Fry. <laughs> so. <laughs> Stephen. Anyway, Fry. Um, any final thoughts on the film? Uh, we're gonna close. We're gonna show everyone the trailer again, just so yeah. uh, we get you hyped up, and you can go check out Candyman uh, when you have a second after Halloween in May, of course. But uh, Kels, any closing thoughts on the film? Yeah, I think it's got such a powerful legacy. It's um, such a, a well-made film as well. And, and, and Nia DaCosta's Candyman, let's just give a shout out to that film as well, or produced by Jordan Peele, directed by Nia DaCosta. Absolutely stunning, sort of 100%. reimagining, reworking of this of this sort of sequel in a way also of, of, of this of this film. Um, I love the two of them together as a companion piece. I think that they're just mwah, um, very, very well made and, and echo each other in a really beautiful way. And of course, uh, Tony Todd, what a guy. Love him to pieces. Um, such a fascinating and, and imposing and impressive man. What about you, Ben? Or what are your final thoughts? Um, I can't really top that, but uh, I would say, <laughs> I, I would say, yes, Nita Costa's film, like to me, and again, this is kind of comes back to where, I, why I think this franchise is underrated because I thought that film was pretty good. Yeah. I felt like it was a, it should have been a bit longer. Like I'm talking about the sequel, the, the reboot cooler, mm. it's not the direct sequel, well, it's direct sequel, but it's made, you know what I'm talking about anyway. So, but I just feel like, I mean, I think there's lots more of the story to tell. I think there's lots more to see, lots more to go into and, and dig around and, 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 and explore. And I hope they get another, another shot at doing one because I really would like to see sort of like a, an end cap or a, a, a trilogy for what they've kind of set up um, if they can do it right. And the only reason I may say that is because of the new Halloween movies they made where the first one was awesome and the second one was not so much. And then the third one was awful. But anyway, I digress. That's but I really do there. like, I did like Nia DaCosta's um, Candyman. I thought it was, I thought it was rock solid and, and I hope that they get to another chance to do one. I think the last lasting legacy of this film is just the fact that it was, it's made in an uncompromising manner. I think mm -hmm. it's like the lesser known Clive Barker movie for people just getting into horror. Obviously it's going to be Hellraiser number one, but yep. um, I really do feel it's got some staying power and it feels fresh. I did want to just mention something. The interesting fact that I found, and mm -hmm. I'll close with this, is that Virginia Madsen, who is fantastic in this film, uh, won Best Actress at the 1993 Fangoria Chainsaw Awards uh, for her role in Candyman, 1992, the original. And mm -hmm. Yaha Abdul-Mateen won Best Lead Performance at the 2022 Fangoria Chainsaw Awards. So he basically won the same award for his role in the Candyman reboot call some 29 years later. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but uh, yeah, that's all I got. Um, we should close. Let's get out of here. Let's do it. All right. Well, thanks again for everyone for watching another edition of 90s Night. I'm Benner from Black Fawn Distro. This is my co-host, of course, Kels McNells. And uh, we are broadcasting on, um, on YouTube. Of course, subscribe, leave mm -hmm. us a comment. And of course, we this this episode is going, uh, we, we're going, we're broadcasting as part of the Halloween in May presented by the Casey Ferguson Show. Thanks, Casey, for having us. We really, really do appreciate it. And thanks, Thank everyone, you. for letting us into your ear holes. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say that? I don't for know. For lack of a better term. <laughs> anyway, here's the trailer again. Take care. We'll see you on another edition of 90s Night. Bye. Have you ever heard of Candyman? If you look in the mirror. You say his name five times. In cities everywhere. Candyman. They whisper his name. Right. Candyman. It's just a story. Candyman. Candyman. Just a ghost story. Candyman. An entire community starts attributing the daily horrors of their lives to a mythical figure. The legend first appeared in 1890. He was attacked, mutilated, and burned to death. Poor Candyman. <laughs> Helen, a woman died in there. Leave it. Everyone knows he isn't real. That's modern oral folklore. Everyone. Except Helen Lyle. Bring it up. 
it ain't safe around here. That don't scare too easy. Wanna know about Ruthie Jean? They ain't never gonna catch him. Who? Candyman. Candy. Who is that? I came for you. Do I know you? Now she is about to discover. Tell him. What's behind the mystery? I'm sick. What's behind the legend? Listen, he's under the bed! And most terrifying of all... Come with me. What's behind the mirror? She's here. Candyman, you don't have to believe. Just beware.